there are, all I can tell you is that there are arguments which speak for the film. First, it's this obvious parallel with, you know, this long tradition in Europe, like from Montesquieu, letters from Persia, Persian letters, and so on, that in order to make fun of us, the best way is to adopt a totally fantasized foreign gaze. No? Just, uh, now the problem is, uh, I think that the Kazakhstan people, I mean, they should, you know, the Bosnian approach would be to, to, to proclaim him a honorary citizen of Kazakhstan, to proudly <laughs> assume, and that would be the best undermining of all possible racist implications. The worst thing you can do is to protest. No, we are not like that. My God, as if anyone was really thinking that they are like that. You know what I mean? By protesting, you confirm that you are like that, no? That's, that's, uh, that's again, but speaking about films, you know which film really interested me, but I'm opposed to it. Uh, but uh, did you see the revolutionary film, Joe? Did you see, and I think it's not, did you see, I hope most of you did, V for Vendetta? I was deeply disappointed in the film. What did you have? A multiple orgasm? You shouted so no. You know why? As a proper English theologist, knowing Chesterton and so on, you know Chesterton, the man who was first dated, I thought the film would make a certain step that it doesn't bear. Namely, you know the film. I will not go into it. Let me, let me draw your attention to a couple of moments which hint at the solidarity link between the opposed figures, V, the revolutionary, and Sattler, the dictator. A, in both cases, till the end, you don't see their real face. V is under the mask, Sattler only on the screen. Second point, you see Sattler only on the screen, but V is also presented as the one who knows perfectly how to manipulate screen, which is why he can do all those manipulations, give his message through. Second point, the ruling party is called North Fire, this totalitarian party, and the only North Fire that you see in the film is when V died, that funeral on a subway. It's really like kind of a Viking funeral. So from this and some other indications, I can tell you what for me would have been the truly radical conclusion that uh, well, it should have been, there should have been no death scene, that one is false I think, this is too cheap, that scene when his second hand betrays V and shoots him as a part of the deal with, uh, not V, uh, that uh, second, uh, kills Sattler as part of the deal with V, no it should have been like this, that at the end V is mortally wounded they took off his mask and it's Sattler. They're the same. That would have been something. I thought, why? It's even justified at the level of uh, what goes on, because it would be just a kind of extension of, of what happens to Evie, okay, Natalie Portman, to use human terms. Because you, you remember that scene when he, V, imprisons her, beats her, and then when she is totally desperate and said, now I don't care if I die, then he shows himself, it was me, I was doing this, beating you in prison just to push you to freedom, to make you, no? But isn't in a way, if you look the film in its totality, that North Party doing the same to the entire population, beating them and so on to make them protest, to make them explode in freedom. So that would have been something, I think. I thought it, the film would go to this, should go to this Hegelian identity of opposites, no, that the two, oppo that Sattler is V, they are the same. What is beneath the mask is the face that you see there on the screen all the time. And I, I was, I thought this would be, people told me there is a big surprise at the end. What surprise? It's no, I, I really think that Hollywood is losing its imagination, like this Da Vinci Code, no? My God, what? What? I mean, every normal Christian knows that things are messy between uh, Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. I thought something politically correct would be to discover that Mary Magdalene was a boy or what? At least I expected something along those lines. Although I must tell you something else. I cannot stop now that I, my God, this will be a deep confession. Uh, I. I will sound like Jimmy Swaggart now and so on, but I almost liked the film, not the novel. You know why? Forget about all this crap, uh, uh, Jesus, sex, and so on, and adopt a much simpler, totally different reading of the film. Uh, why 
does God have to have sex? I think the approach is the same as we should adopt. My good friend, British Lacanian analyst Darian Leader, proposed this idea apropos of X Files. Why do so many things go on out there? You know, all these aliens invading, to cover up the fact that nothing goes on here. No, no sex between Mulder and the two of them. And I think what if we approach it in the same way? The poor Christ has to have sex to cover up that she is freely. That's between Sophie, did you notice? Between Sophie and Langdon, no sex. This is why they had to do it up there, no? So I think, what if we forget about divinity and read the film as a kind of a wild, whatever we call it, psychoanalysis of a girl who is obviously frigid traumatized because she witnessed what in psychoanalytic jargon we call the primordial scene. You went, she turns home, basically parental copulation and so on. No? A trauma. And then what I moderately like is the dissolution of the film, more than in the novel, the novel is more stupid, is not this standard Hollywood solution which would have been she should be restored to healthy sexuality. No, she remains frigid. It's just that what happens at the end is that she just acquires a symbolic space. You know, at the end, she is affirmed as the leader reference of that group of believers around her and so on. A social space is created for her where she can leave her, let's call it, desexualized identity or whatever. And it's a nice solution. I mean, I think it's absolutely authentic. I, I don't think that the proper lesson of analysis is... Uh, like, you know, the only, this stupid heterosexual male chauvinist. The only proper thing for a woman is to find a male partner. If not, she will be free with hysterical or whatever. I think that from a true psychoanalysis, to find, to select an asexual role, a nun or whatever, okay, it can be pathological, but it can also very well be an authentic position. So for me, what the film does is from the failed eros, love as eros, it passes to Love as agape, which, as Terry Eagleton put it nicely in one of his last books, it's basically political love, no? So again, one should be here uh, very, very precise, like when Lacan says woman is a symptom of man. This doesn't mean the usual male chauvinist wisdom, oh, woman is nothing, just the reflection of man, man creates the woman. I mean, what Lacan means by symptom is something much more radical. Symptom is that what is in you more than you, like symptom is not your reflection, you depend on the symptom. Symptom, paradoxically for Lacan, pre-exists that of which it is a symptom. Symptom hinges on it. The best idea that I have, example of this woman as a symptom of man, would be a wonderful anecdote somebody told me in Argentina of a local poet there who, okay, to cut a long story short, Every five, ten years, he changes his mistress, no? And his poetry changes accordingly. First, his mistress was a kind of a military dictatorship, right-wing supporter. He wrote nationalist, patriotic poetry. Then it was a Maoist guerrilla, and then she wrote revolutionary poetry. Now it's a New Ager. She writes about New Age. You know, like, his poetry is determined, is determined by that. Or, to put it in other terms, Imagine woman as a symptom of man in it, and this is a nice metaphor. This means not, oh, you, a woman, are only a symptom, but it means you walk around, I'm a symptom. Does anybody want me? Whose symptom should I be? Do you want me as a symptom? Do you want me as a symptom? And even a nun would be then symptom at the zero level. This means, no, I want to be nobody's symptom. I want to be just a symptom, has to put it, no? So, again, along these lines, and so on and so on. I talk too much. Okay, good. Yeah. Be yeah. How does it work in the transferential situation? Or in your terms, uh, subjects supposed to know? Yeah, but uh, uh, here I would have to make a step further. I think that, uh, incidentally, as to subjects supposed to know, you know, this is a very complex notion. And speaking about Spielberg at the beginning, I think that in Munich there is a wonderful, did you see Munich? There is a wonderful example of subjects supposed to know. 
And I mean, it's the most weird moment in the film. I love it. You remember after the Israeli agents get their task, no liquidate the